week's episode of the Workers' World Labour Show, coming to you from our virtual studios in Kailicha, Cape Town. I'm your host, Helga Janssen Dahlia. The COVID-19 pandemic has severely affected the world's people and their livelihoods. It is estimated that millions have been infected and billions more have lost their jobs. Many workers in South Africa have faced the same threats and it is estimated that 3 million have already lost their jobs. Over the past 30 years, we have seen the growth of the informal sector, particularly in the home-based work sector. In today's show, we look at home-based work and the impact of COVID-19. But before we go into our in-studio discussion, let's take a look at an insert produced by the Workers' World Media Productions editorial team. Home-based workers are an invisible workforce, both to government and to many employers, invisible in the sense that they are not recognized as workers, yet they are indeed part of supply chain, so they're aware that they are there. We are home-based workers is, uh, uh, is very important for us to work because um, people need clothing to dress themselves. And I think that um, our homeboys workers uh, also deserve to that the government can give us work because at the moment government don't recognize us. They don't see us, they don't know us, they don't do anything about us. Home-based workers are workers who do productive or paid work either from their own homes or from collective spaces close to their homes, within the vicinity of their home. So for example, in South Africa, you could find that um, home-based workers who'd work in a collective space um, in the township, for example, where they would then pay rent for the space that they are working on. <laughs> Wonge umtu, I mean, uya inete ndwe tungu weyo, sinibam jia sinibam jia tungu weyo. So msabe nzuetu, uba leke kakulu, because aka kumdono wa amba mozeo stratu enenga nyebanga. So which is, lelo na si, sino pandu vo, o, o, o lukulu ku ekonomi, kuko indo si, si enza ya ku ekonomi. Beka teki daisara, daisara di ngana jesporin, daisara ama kuhina na maseme, jana mashis, ngase yubo nuku taimu. was at home for two, three years, and so I found that bit Abby. She gave me the job and I started here to work for her. No, no pressure on me while I worked at Abigail Fashions. Before there was a lot of pressure on me at the big factories. And I've earned much more than I'm earning now. But I'm satisfied with what I'm getting here because it's near to a house, no need to travel. The wages if you have in, your, in, in, in clothing, yes, you have to, you, as you work, you know, every week when you work, then you know, ah, uh, my boss is going to pay me by the end of Friday. But now, I'm working in a co-op, I have to work according what what the company applies you for work. Certain bags, certain amount, and that is only the certain money you're gonna get. Like for instance, it's a 2,000. In, in, the, in the clothing, you get 1,300. But in the co-op, you get by the end of the month, 1,200 per week. By the end of the month, you're only earning a 2,000 rand. Umbozo huto au linge na angani, mubaga loko si 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 peya mu i i i asipei istain yabo e e asipei mali isistain. Umbozo kwa lo sunga mna bandu ba producer yuko, kwa iklient inokuza direct cut ne, then i umbozo wetu nga petele kule imali sienda yangu, rather than ndo ba kubeba kwa middleman in between. Like we work in there for melomit. And it's very important because the people need it, the doctors and the nurses need accounts every day. So they have to go a total out by our guys every day. And we made a 
the feet of the gowns also. We made the coveralls, we made the caps, so it's very important. That's why we have to let the worker every day out. We can't hold back for the next day or that. They have to be work every day. They have to go out. There's no inclusion and recognition of them as workers and therefore you know they they have they fall under the radar of any policy it's very unhealthy for us to work in that environment because there isn't enough warmness in our place it's a lot of things that must be done in in our co-op so if the government can help us of upgrading our place, see that our in a in a nice environment of working. Because the moment you're in a nice environment of working, and you will be happy, and you will be glad to work, and come running to your work every day. If you look at home-based workers, it's really under the capitalist economy is that the the site of production has been moved into the privacy of the home, into the privacy of working class homes. So workers then absorb all those risks that would otherwise be within a factory setup. For the COVID-19, it was by a work hard, it was at Elke, it was work from month to month, it was at Elke, tweede week a different work had to do, and as a project to visit, it was over a work that had worked, in ons het um, alles ingesit wat ons kon, maar wat COVID begin, lockdown begin, het het gestop en is um, Township Patents is een export um, company. So, um, verder is daar, het ons in between maas gedoen vir um, private mense, wat stukjes ingebring het en ons is baie dankbaar vir die. Wat... Ook aan gong het ons hulle lockdown, koop het hulle knok salendlie. In lockdown, COVID-19, it's a couple of the little cool. Um, the yellow man that is such a little shade, especially take a cool, and then go that is cake you and a cool too, but because Lalin, I was Lalin's Lalin. So it would be very important to recognize and value all forms of work, especially work in, work in the informal economy. As we look to to come out of COVID-19 period as we look to restore the economy, it would be critical for, for government to consider informal workers and find ways of including them in this ailing economy to, you know, to, 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 to boost the economy, but obviously to do that in a way that's inclusive, that allows for regulation, but again I would emphasize not punitive regulation, but progressive and inclusive rec regulation to, to recognize informal workers who are already there and find ways of actively including them. They're already economic actors, they, they contribute economically, but for them to be part of the mainstream in an inclusive way. Welcome back if you've just joined us. You're watching the Workers World Labour Show and we're talking home-based workers and the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. In our virtual studios, we're really happy to have an array of um, home-based work activists, uh, researchers, um, starting with our colleague in uh, India. We well, we, we'd love to welcome Janavi Dave, International Coordinator for Homelet South, South Asia. Welcome, Janawi. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. We also joined by Emily Melanzi, Empire Cooperative Cape Town. Welcome, Emily. Thank you for having me. And last but not, not least, and certainly no stranger to the workers we go, we have Vanessa Pele, Program Coordinator for the Continent of Africa. Welcome, Vanessa. Thank you, Chalga. Let's start with Janawi. Janawi, um, explain to us the extent of home-based work globally and in which sectors would we find this thing of home-based work? Right. Um, so just to start by saying that you know, there's a recent ILO statistics, which mentions that there were over 260 million home-based workers across the world before the pandemic. 
and this number is only increasing now. We also have this wonderful statistics team at WeGo, which has been making these country level statistics brief. And recently they've come up with two statistics brief, one for India and one for Bangladesh. And um, what it mentions is that there are over 41 million home-based workers in India and over 10 million home-based workers just in Bangladesh. So we're talking about a large section of the workforce. Um, also home-based work, work is a global phenomenon. It happens in developed countries as well as in developing countries. Now they're definitely defined differently in developed countries where workers don't commute to work but telecommute to work. While in developing countries, the work is provided through a series of subcontractors to a home-based worker sitting at her own place. So say for example, in Pakistan, um, home-based workers working in global garment supply chain, they are provided work to do at home, but through a series of these subcontractors who would provide work at their own home and would provide piece rate for every piece completed. The other th aspect is that home-based work, work is found in both urban as well as rural areas and it's found across all sectors. So it's not just one sector specific. So, you know, you'd find home-based workers in say, for example, assembling motor parts or assembling toys or, um, you know, even segregating e-waste to more traditional sectors like making handicrafts or uh, embroidering garments or making incense sticks, et cetera. So it, it, it definitely is a departure um, and we're going to get in a moment, but I just wanted to make the point that it, it seems as if the tradition, well, not traditional, but the perception that home-based work is about taking care of people is actually not that. It's um, almost like a decentralization of the production line. So if you, you're talking about assembling and packaging, etc., so people are, are, are taking segments of the production line into their homes. Is that, is that a correct um, assessment, Janawi? Absolutely. So, you know, they're part of many manufacturing and service industries. So home-based workers produce goods and provide services from in and around homes. So specifically, if I talk about, say, for example, the garment sector, you know, there could be a large brand sitting out of US or Europe, and they find it easier to get production done in Asia. Right? because our labor laws are weak here. And so they may provide work to um, uh, an export house or a supplier in our part of the world who provides it to maybe a supplier who would provide it to a sub-supplier, to a contractor, to a subcontractor, and then the work goes to home-based workers. Right? It's a very um, well-designed production, production supply chain. So uh, not for this conversation right now, hopefully we can get to it, but the notion of work is certainly going to be influenced by this uh, uh, professional life, if you like, of remote work. And I think that, that they, they will be an intersection between the notion of, home, of remote work as a result of the pandemic and traditional home but it seems that most home-based workers are um, Is this so? And why, Vanessa? Um, Helga, the short answer would be that because women are a source of cheap labor in the way the economy is currently organized. But for the women themselves, Working from home allows them for, to, to be flexible between pay, doing paid work and the perpetual unpaid care work that women do. So it allows for that, that level of flexibility. Um, for homes headed where women are the breadwinners, it's, a, it's an important source of income, as we will maybe see in the, in the, sec, in the, in the video um, interviews of home-based workers. Also, it does provide some level of flexibility in terms of, of their own labor, but we know and we hear from home-based workers all the time about how they try and combine their social reproduction with the actual productive work. So um, just the other day, we were on a webinar where a worker from um, 
from Thailand was explaining how she repairs fishing nets while she's taking care of her children or while she's engaging in some leisurely activity like watching television. So for women, it provides, provides that level of flexibility in terms of their, of their labor time. And as we've said, they, they, um, some autonomy around the way that work is organized. It's also a, there's also low barriers to entry into home-based work. If we look across the different sectors, um, in, in South Africa, for example, we would have the spaza shops or the production line, as Jan B has already said, and we will talk about that later, about how the production, how the informalization of the clothing sector, for example, found its way into people's homes. Uh, um, Vanessa, can, I bring, um, can I bring Emily into this? Because you, you, you know, you, you're talking about the flexibility that it offers predominantly women. Um, but Emily, what are the pros and cons to have your work basically in your living space? Emily? Well, Helga, uh, the, the, firstly, the pros is that, like as Vanessa mentioned, that we are flexible. We have our own time, you know, we do our own time management. Um, we work out our own routines and how we're going to get things done. And also that we are around the house, so we are able to balance. We, have the, we are able to maintain that balance. Um, as well as that, you know, it's entry for anybody. You don't really need to, like, have a particular um, kind of education or something. When you're a home-based worker, the market is open for you because there's so many options for you to do, from the production to way speaking to domestic workers. So it, improv it provides the opportunity to those who cannot get the opportunity to work in a more um, formal sector. But the cons to this is that we have no job security, you know, so um, our livelihoods are always at risk. You know, there's no um, safety for us where we can say, like, during this pandemic, you know, when it happens, our income is at risk. As well as we are not in, uh, we don't have the benefits that you would have if you work for, you know, a big company or if you work for an employee, we don't get the minimum wage. Whatever we produce is what we're going to be taking home at the end of the day. And also that we are easily exploited when we have like the production lines, when we have those middle men, um, men in between, you know, we don't say we don't um, go out and get our own work, we get provided. So we just have to accept whatever the costs are for the labor, which might not even be what it's really worth. So basically, you know, it, it's, it's, a, it's a very good thing to have as home-based workers, but like with those, um, Cons, you know, you, you always have to find the balance yourself. Like, is this worth it? Is it not worth it? You know, because the women are the breadwinners, so we have to make things work. Uh, Janawi, can I bring you in here? Um, Emily describes um, a, 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 a trying to find the balance, but also descriptions of um, the risk to livelihood that COVID-19 has brought. And I'm sure that COVID-19, um, the pandemic was not the only risk. What are the conditions um, and give us a sense of the level of earnings um, of home-based workers in other parts of the world? Right. Um, just to answer that question, you know, home is the workplace for home-based workers. So if the housing condition is poor, the working condition for home-based workers also become poor. In many parts of the world, especially in South Asia, um, home-based workers live in slums. In other parts, they live in, you know, informal settlements too. And um, can I, can I, let me, let, let, can I ask you to pause there? We're going to have to take a break. We'll come back after these messages. Welcome back. We're talking home-based work and we're chatting with Vanessa Pillay, Janawi Dave and uh, Emily Melanzi from the home-based workers landscape, the work, um, the activist landscape. Before the break, um, I asked you to give us a sense of what the conditions of home-based workers are in other parts of the world. Right. Thank you, Helga. So again, just to say that home-based workers live 
from their homes, I mean, work from their homes, and if the housing condition is poor, so is the working condition, right? In many parts of South Asia, they live in slums where there is no tenure security, but also they don't have access to basic services like electricity, individual water taps, or individual toilets. Now, just to say that these conditions do change from one continent to the other, you know, it's, it's definitely much better in Thailand and Chile, but again, there is, there is for improving these working conditions many fold. Now, going back to the earnings of home-based workers, across, we've seen across the globe that they earn well below the minimum wages prescribed by the countries. Um, now, just to give you an example, in Bangladesh, um, there's a lot of government sector work that comes and home-based workers do a range of activities. It could be just be finishing work of cutting threads, uh, putting buttons, drawstrings. Now, per piece that they make, they earn less than two cents. Yeah? They never end up earning more than, say, five, five dollars a day if they're working for 10 hours. They work anywhere between four hours to 10 hours, um, depending on the availability of the work. Again, just to say, it, you know, the work comes, uh, sometimes there's so much work uh, coming in, but there are you know, times when they have absolutely no work. So the work is very seasonal. So say, for example, in Nepal, uh, the women who do, women home-based workers who do knitting, um, they only have work for three months in the entire year. So, so just to say that um, the, the work is very irregular for them. Um, I want to bring, thank you for that, uh, Janawi. I want to bring Vanessa in here. Uh, Vanessa, it, it does, well, obviously there are uneven levels of um, how home-based work can be beneficial. Um, Janawi spoke about Chile, she spoke about and in South Africa, um, give us a sense of what the protections, if any, they are for women and also the actual impact. Um, because if I'm working on a decentralized production line from my home, I am also obviously my labor in the home also has to be counted. Taking care of children, of elderly parents, making food, etc. How, how does that play out in South Africa, Vanessa? Now you know that those reproductive duties that women do, or what I earlier described as care work, is unpaid. So there's no value attached to that. So women put themselves under tremendous strain to do the paid part of the work and combine it with the unpaid um, care work. There are two categories of home-based workers. There's the self-employed home-based workers. So those workers would you know, provide the, the, their own means of production, their own raw materials but then they would be dependent on an intermediary maybe for access to the market to sell, to sell what they produce. Then we have the home-based workers, we have, which we have largely been speaking about in this conversation now, who would be part of a supply chain um, and part of a production line that's often camouflaged or obscured as a commercial relationship. So, they are ineffectively engaged in employment relationships, but those are then masked as um, commercial relationships. So as Emily has already said, they have almost little or no bargaining power. So it's, you know, access to work, it's, it's work that is remotely supervised through a, through, a, through a line of intermediaries, the patents or the the, the, the specifications would come from, say, a retailer, for example. So there would be a customer at the end of this line, which is effectively the, the employer. Then through a long chain is supervising the production within the privacy of a home. And it's not, so back to your point earlier that you were making now with COVID-19 and we're going to see an increase in this kind of work. It's very important to make the distinction between the types of work and the social classes that do that different work. And we must be careful that home-based work now doesn't become lumped together with what working class women have been doing traditionally under extremely exploitative conditions. So the incomes tend to be very low. There's job insecurity. 
um, they're not protected by labor laws because in our context in South Africa, there's no national data on the extent of home-based work. So home-based workers are not included in our labor force survey because home as a place of work is not counted. So that's the beginning of our problem. So you can just see if their workers are not visible to the system, to the policy environment, which means that they then get excluded. I want to bring Vanessa, um, um, I'm sorry, I want to bring Emily into this one. Um, Emily, Vanessa talks about exclusion in the formal labor protections as we've come to know it in South Africa. Give us a how Empire, um, the organization that you are working and what they have attempted to do um, to bring the, um, the conditions of work of home-based workers under a bigger spotlight. So um, as Empire, we are a cooperative, so it's not only, um, we're not typically what you would have like at the Spicer shop or, you know, the poker or the broker on the street. So we are a more a group, more democratically run. So this is practically our little business, but we are just part of a supply chain. So for us, you know, not being able to be recognized as, you know, as workers, um, it has put us in, in a position that we would like to put ourselves out there. That's where WeGo comes in with helping us in order to get recognized in, um, how can I put it, is that we are organizing ourselves, you know, as home-based workers so that we can get recognition, so that we can, you know, go up to government and tell them, you know, we also, we supply or we provide employment, which ineffectively also contributes to this economy. So our first thing that we have been doing is that is organizing ourselves as home-based workers so we can take on the challenges that we are, we've been facing, you know, because we've been in operation for over six years as, you know, as a home-based work group. And we haven't, you know, come as far as to actually, you know, get into contact with people that can actually come and look at our situations. Like we need to provide for our own um, work space. You know, we need to pay our own rent. We need to feed our families, you know, stuff like that, basically. Um, I want to, that, that's, you know, that's such an interesting observation about, firstly, of course, the fact that there's a mini factory in my bedroom, in my front room. Um, Janawi, just give us a sense. So the, what Emily now describes is that I'm also responsible for the operational costs of this mini factory that's in my front room. If I need to, um, uh, I don't know, staple something, and it's an electronic stapler, for example, it's my electricity, and my hourly rate is supposed to cover that? Right. I mean, thank you for, for pointing that out. You know, the, the thing is that home-based workers also take the burden of cost of production. And when we say cost of production, like you mentioned, it's electricity. It's the machine that they use, like, you know, for example, the sewing machine that they have, they purchase it, it's not given by the employer. Or sometimes, you know, the thread that you use, or the small things like scissors that you use. So all of that slowly adds up to the cost of production for home-based workers. Now, um, when home-based workers calculate the piece rate, unfortunately, though, they don't end up calculating this cost of production or adding it to that. Now that's been one of our strategy and we do a lot of trainings on how do you calculate your piece rates to match the minimum wages and how do you calculate that to include the cost of production. So this is something which home-based workers have now started doing. But they Jinawi, face Jinawi, I want to ask you just to pause there for a moment. We're going to come back to that point to you at home. Don't go away. We'll be back after the messages. Welcome back. Vanessa, I just want to say that I know that you want to make a contribution. Let's just allow Janawi, Janawi to complete um, her thought. Continue, Janawi. You were talking about um, the operational costs that also become the responsibility of the home-based worker. Right. So again, just to add, you know, there's a lot of cost of production that I've mentioned, but also sometimes people have to buy a little extra garment 
also. So they spend a lot of money to produce a product and generally it's never accounted for. So the cost of production definitely needs to be added, but then there's another concept. We are saying minimum wages, but we are saying minimum wages with cost of production. And the third concept is living wages. We're far away from that. And we say that also is a concept that needs to be you know, introduced to home-based work. Vanessa, you wanted to make a point? Yes, thank you, Helga. I wanted to make the point linked to what Emily was saying that they are effectively little businesses. And I think that's the, that's the policy challenge um, for us in South Africa, because realistically, all of these home-based work operations are not budding entrepreneurs. They are workers. And we can see from how the production happens. It's actually as sectors have informalized, that capital has found a way to bring the production into the home of working class people. And they bear the brunt of those production costs. And you know, then they are told well, you're a business and um, how much are you selling this, this you know, how much do, you, do we pay you for this piece rate? Right? Just to give you an example in the production of the face masks, the home-based workers were producing thousands of masks at a cost of 2 rand 50 per mask. And if you look at how much mask, the average cost of how much a mask is being sold. Home 50 rand, Vanessa, 50 rand. Exactly. So home-based workers like Emily and many others are, pay, are getting paid at a rate of 2 rand 50 per mask. Vanessa, I just want to, I want to ask you, um, well, I want to make the comment that it would seem that there are certain framings that are being dangled you know we live in an environment especially in south africa young women are enticed with the notion of being business owners entrepreneurship um being in control of your own time yeah as emily was described it is a measure of flexibility despite that there is actually a as you've been saying vanessa that um home-based workers are paying for the privilege of being employed because they are being employed and um they're paying for is paying the operational costs having no protection in law because they are part of the informal economy not being trade unionized organized you know, in a way in which the government sees them as a, as a power block vanessa and i'd like to also put for that comment to Emily as well. Vanessa? Sorry, can you just repeat the question, Helga? I was making the question that it would seem that the, 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 there are certain catchphrases that are being having flexibility of time, um, being in control of your own as such. But the reality in what all of you described is that Home-based workers are all paying getting that little contract because they recognized in law. No, I think we have a gremlin with Vanessa, so I'm going to give comment Emily perhaps to comment on. Um, can you hear me? Sharon, I think we have some gremlin. I can hear you. Who is that, Vanessa? Yes. Can you hear me now? Okay. I can hear you now. Please continue. As you were saying, so and, 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 and as I was saying, it's not of all of them are budding entrepreneurs, and there's no problem with entrepreneurship, but then it must be duly supported within, and there must be an enabling environment to support them to thrive. So, you know, it's, 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 it's useless disguising an effectively employment relationship as a commercial relationship and then saying, you are, you, you know, you are budding little business and therefore you have to, you know, you're flexible and all the rest of that, as Emily was describing. A few weeks ago, we saw the premier of the Western Cape, Alan Windy, going around and visiting some of these small home-based work operations. And again, there the comment was made that these are businesses that need support. We're not against businesses, but we must really 
honestly make the distinction between the entrepreneurs and also what kind of support they need to be to you know to really be effective but that the reality is that the vast majority of the home operations are actually workers. Vanessa, Vanessa, can I ask to hold on? I think Emily and to get her take um, on this notion of, um, you know, the, the, the flexibility and the ability to own in the lack of protection in law. Emily? You know, Helga, like Vanessa said, <laughs> we are not all, you know, budding in businesses and stuff like that. Because let's take into consideration that, you know, as home-based workers, we do not have immediate access to um, savings and stuff like that. That should a loss of income occur in our cases that we are able, like a business, go out there and go to the bank and make a loan. We won't be able to get a loan or anything at the bank. So, um we cannot, you know, actually classify ourselves as businesses because, you know, we don't have that. Most of the ladies that I work with, you know, they coming out of big factories, they're over the ages already. So they are breadwinners and they need to support their families, you know. So in terms of that, they have to make ends meet. So being a business, we, we cannot even assist each other when, it time, when time comes for us, you know, to get finances or what we don't have cushions to fall back on like that you know we can go like i said to go and get a loan a business loan a short-term loan we won't even be able to repay it that's the situation that we find ourselves in as home-based workers so i, I want I, to bring Jan Janabi in, into this part of the conversation all three of you have spoken of the way in which this home-based work can be accessed and there seems to be a pipeline now, in South Africa, we've had a big battle um, around labor brokers. Is it the same based work in the home-based work sector? Sorry, Helka. Actually, my internet connectivity is extremely poor, so I could get your question. Can I request you to repeat it, please? No problem. I'm asking about the, um, you know, all of you have, discussed, have spoken about the pipeline of middle people that exists in order for a home-based worker to access a contract. Um, in South Africa, we have a big problem around labor broking. Is it the same in, in the home-based work sector? And is it, um, you know, is it, is it found in other parts of the sector in other parts of the world? Sorry, Helga, again, the question got missed out. I'm really sorry. Um, the internet's very poor. I'm just going to switch off my video for a second. Maybe I can hear it okay. better. We seem to have a problem with Janawi's connection. I want to ask that question of Vanessa. Um, Vanessa, maybe you can give us a sense of, particularly as I've indicated, South Africa having a big problem with labor broking. So in the home-based workers sector, we, we talk about a reliance on intermediaries. Um, so, as you could recall earlier on, I spoke about two categories of home-based workers. So, for example, the self-employed craft workers don't have access to markets to sell their products. So, they would be dependent on an intermediary for market access. And there would be some kind of, um, you know, a brokering relationship there where the cost might be, you know, the final cost of sale might be determined by the intermediary. And because the craft workers do not have alternate means to access the wider market, they would then be dependent on that intermediary. We have craft workers in South Africa that have, that have started out their craft work uh, as part of interventions by NGOs to assist uh, HIV positive people. And those craft, because they had no means to buy the, you know, to, uh, um, HIV positive patients went on to antiretroviral treatment and NGOs that were supporting them then discovered that actually they didn't have the means to sustain themselves, to buy the food. That Vanessa, they Vanessa, I'm going to ask you to put I think this is very this is a very very important conversation because it also talks about power relations within our formerly 
is able to access those markets. To you at home, don't go away. We're talking home-based work and the COVID-19 pandemic. We'll be back after these messages. So Welcome back. If you've just joined us, you're watching the Work Labour Show. Vanessa, you were, you, were, you were busy explaining, particularly in the craft sector, um, home-based workers who are reliant on intermediaries, as your sector calls them, to access markets. Please continue. So I was explaining how this, these, these relationships have evolved. And we find that many craft workers in South African context use, you know, the traditional skills like bead making, bead work and other crafts um, to sustain themselves. But many of those have also, those initiatives have grown out of NGOs supporting people that were on HIV um, antiretroviral treatment and the NGOs then discovered, but these people didn't have the means to buy the food that they needed to, to sustain themselves while they were on, on, on the therapy. And so it has grown. And many of those workers now produce crafts for high-end stores globally. But those workers are not, are not in a position that they really, as I've said earlier on, making a, a fortune out of it. You know, if you look at the cost yes, of Vanessa, what... Vanessa, can I just ask, because you're describing something and because of course um emily i'm sure you can 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 identify with this and even janawi that the 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 especially in the craft um sector it was about providing an income stream during our big hiv pandemic across the world right um but but vanessa the formal economy in south africa is still highly racialized and so access to, for example, um, a international clothing designer who suddenly wants bead work for a runway show, the, 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 the people who produce that bead work have very little control over whether they even get it because the control of access to that kind of market is still racialized in this country. Um, is that a fair assessment, Vanessa? Yes. Unfortunately, it's true, but also as, as we see um, black economic empowerment, there's also a class distinction. To give, you a good to give you an example that I think will capture this is now with the production of personal protective equipment and the subsequent scandal in the, um, the, the corruption that went along with that. Home-based worker collective that has been doing PPEs 40 families as we speak today have had their income stopped abruptly because they, have, they, they were given work through this stream. And as the special investigations now continue, all of those production lines have been halted. Those workers, I'm 100% sure, did not make the millions, the multi-millions from those deals. But they're, because they have no protection, the, and because the investigation is un, undergoing, they, is going on now, they have just had the production abruptly stopped. We're talking about 40 families who were producing PPE through want, an intermediary who now have no income and no recourse. I want to bring Janawi into this part of the conversation. Janawi, I'm sure you know as a um, an Indian activist in, in the progressive and social justice landscape that South Africa has a huge corruption in process um, 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 environment and we've even seen this in the pandemic. Um, give us a sense if, if, if this kind of um, exploitation of processes um, is, is, is also found in other parts um, of our partner countries if you like, like India, like um, Brazil. Right, yeah I mean you know, just to say that home-based workers, now again, to put them back into uh, the socio-economic demography that we have, we're talking about people who are poor. We are talking about, you know, also in our part of the world, there is a huge caste system. So home-based workers actually belong to the lower caste, right? So they're poor, they belong to a lower caste, and the work actually stopped completely. You know, so a, a lot of these 
big brands are going and saying bankruptcy. We are in a huge loss and they're not providing any form of work. What we're also demanding is, you know, the supply chain relief for them. But we see that the government is not responding. And there's a big reason for it is because Mumbai's workers have never been recognized. They haven't been recognized and not being recognized at the moment. So when we demand for it, it's easy for employers and government to shrug off and say, you know, they were never workers. They were never part of the supply chains at all. So it's become very convenient for employers as well as for government to shrug off and say that there's nothing for them. Um, Emily, I want to bring you in here. Give us a sense um, within Empire um, whether, you know, Vanessa spoke about that 40 families have already been affected by the investigations into corruption. Um, has there been a sense of that, um, the spill out of the PPE scandal, if you like, um, into the, your, your members? Um, yes, some of my members were doing PPEs via somebody as well, privately, not as Empire, the, the whole group. Um, and as soon as that scandal, you know, exploded, you know, the, that, because in the meanwhile, before we did the PPEs, we were at home. So this was a source of income. So as immediately when that happened, that we got cut off, some of my members got cut off, that income got cut off as well. So. I mean, we are so de we are dependent on what happens around us in the economy. So whatever goes bad, we are the most affected with with it. With this, although we have been given a lifeline now, we are busy back with production with something else other than essentials. But it just shows that we are we we get the short end of the stick when things go wrong in the economy or when things like corruption takes place. We are the most harmed in all of this. Um. Emily, I want to ask you, so the formal trade union sector, I'm talking about the clothing workers, I'm talking about the retail um, aligned unions like Sakawu, et cetera, have they made overtures to home-based workers? Have they, has there been any interest to organize um, home-based workers? Um, not, from, not, the, not that I'm aware of, not, we have never, I've never been in contact with them. The only you know, organization that we have been getting help in organizing ourselves has been coming from WeGo, you know, in order for us to go out there to um, approach probably um, the uh, unions. But we as home-based workers, we, we need the proper steps, like the guidance on how we do, what do we do. So at this moment, that's where we are. Vanessa, um, just give us, uh, we, 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 in the last segment now, we've got three minutes. I think it's really, really useful for our viewers to know about the work of WeGo, and then we'd also like to know about the work, Janawi, of Home-Based um, International. Vanessa? Um, thank you, Helga. Maybe just to fill in briefly on what Emily said in, in terms of union organizing. Um, it's said that the nature of the world of work has changed so much that a young worker like Emily has never worked in a unionized environment. And therefore, as we go, we go stands for women in informal employment, globalizing and organizing. So as a global network, we recognize that the informalization of work is a global phenomenon and it pre predominate, predominantly affects women. And therefore, the only way to get voice, to get recognition is through being organized. And so therefore, we go as a network is focused on empowering uh, the working poor, especially women, to have that visibility and that voice to organize for inclusive policies, to organize for recognition, and to organize for um, social protection and the extension of worker rights to cover them. Janawi, social protection, of course, um, very, very important. Give us a sense of what the work of Homelet International is, a global organization. Right. Also, just going back to what Vanessa and Emily mentioned, uh, you know, home-based workers don't always organize as trade unions, but they do organize as membership-based organizations. So Emily's organization is a cooperative. It's a membership-based organization. We have trade unions. We have community-based organizations. We have SAGs. And just 
to say that there are different forms of organizing and we need to recognize them. And of course, we need to push trade unions to organize home-based workers, and that goes a long way. In fact, uh, I also wanted to add to Vigo's role. Uh, Vigo is conducting a study of impact of COVID-19 on informal economy workers. And in Asia, South Asia, we've done a much larger study of various locations. And um, what we found was that during the lockdown, the income dipped by 82 percent and even post the lockdown the income has only come up by say 47 percent however this study is very important is because we found three things that worked during the pandemic for home-based workers uh, the first is you know that cooperatives and what we call producer-owned companies actually are recovering much better than home-based workers who are not organized right so an organization like Emily's would definitely recover much faster than the unorganized home-based workers or home-based workers organized into different other forms. The second thing is that home-based workers, some of them in you know, other parts of the world are organized as trade unions and they had better access to relief, which was provided through government or through individual organizations. And so the now, now yeah. I'm gonna have to, we, we've come to the end of our show and I've allowed you to complete those scenarios and I want to encourage um, our viewers out there to go and look, um, uh, go and search for WeGo and for Homeland International on the internet. They're doing some amazing work. If you yourself are a home-based worker, go and find out more about how you can um, perhaps improve the conditions um, under which your home is being turned into a factory. Thank you so much to Vanessa Pillay. Emily Melanzi, Janawi Davi, all from um, Homeland International, from Uyghur and from Empire to you at home. Thank you for watching. Until next time, this is us from the Workers' World Labour Show.